Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Dunn, and I am the Executive Director at the New Haven Pride Center. Uh, thank you for those of you who have joined us for tonight's conversation with the incredible artists John Suro and Jonathan Joseph, uh, the latest artists to exhibit on the walls of the New Haven Pride Center's Great Room Gallery here at the New Haven Pride Center. Um, tonight's uh, art is part of our exhibit, or the, the art we're going to be discussing is part of our current exhibit, which is Artistic Perspectives on HIV, uh, which is part of the center's larger World AIDS Day observation program, which is running through from today, November 30th through December 3rd. Um, I do want to encourage you to visit newhavenpridecenter.org slash World AIDS Day uh, to find out more about our entire program for this week, uh, including the centerpiece uh, 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 moment that will happen tomorrow evening on World AIDS Day uh, with the world premiere of Night Sweats, a multidisciplinary uh, performance program featuring the music of Noah Smith. Um, and with that said, I'm going to stop talking because nobody's here to listen to me talk. Um, I do want to encourage all of you watching, if you have any comments or questions for our artists, please uh, feel free to comment on whatever social media platform you are watching us on. And we'll be sure to uh, post your comment up on the event and make sure our artists know to answer your question. So with that said, I'm going to bring to the virtual stage our first artist, which is John Suro. Welcome, John. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Uh, and uh, I have to say, John, you look great with your art hanging behind you. Um, can you uh, give our, our listeners and watchers a little bit more information about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm a Connecticut native. Um, I have had many incarnations. Uh, my most recent was I just finished an MFA in interdisciplinary art at the Massachusetts College of Art and design um, last summer. Um, I was an art director for about 25 years. Then I became a teacher. I'm in my ninth year teaching. And then I got the MFA. So my artistic practice studio wise um, has been about for the past five years. My undergrad degree was in visual art, but then I went into graphic design and marketing and always wanted to get back to the studio and finally did. I muted. I do that to myself. Um, <laughs> we are we are excited to have you um, as part of this conversation tonight. The other person I'm going to bring in is our other artist, Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Patrick. Hi, John. Hi. I'm excited. Jonathan, give us here. a little more information about who you are. Sure. Uh, absolutely. Um, for one thing, I am super proud to serve on the board here at the New Haven Pride Center and I want to thank all of our staff and everyone who's been working so hard to bring this and other content to you guys um, and uh, welcome you into my studio as well that's uh, what you see behind me around me uh, this slightly scary looking dude over here uh, that I'm working on uh, I am a consultant and entrepreneur currently the CEO of a children's fashion ed tech and publishing company called Little Red Fashion uh, I also consult in a bunch of different projects and for the past eight years have been a professional artist. Uh, I'm an abstract painter working primarily in oils and mixed media and uh, most of my work really explores narratives of transformation, whether that be through trauma, whether that be through my own HIV diagnosis. Um, I really began painting uh, as a way to counteract some of the issues associated with my cerebral palsy and fine motor skill issues. Um, and when I realized it was effective for that, I, you know, when I started converted in 2010, uh, I thought, what better way to process this whole HIV, uh, you know, situation than through art, because it seemed to work uh, for other things. And lo and behold, it did. Uh, and I created a series which also showed at the Pride Center a couple of years back called the Gold Series, which was a 50 piece exploration of HIV and AIDS. And uh, never again will I commit myself to 50 pieces because it's a lot more uh, than you would think. Uh, you know, I thought it was a nice round number uh, and then it drove me crazy for four years. Uh, and well, so, you know, I, I am not a, uh, an academically trained artist as it were. I'm completely self-taught and am blessed enough to resonate with collectors and have built a base. So for anyone watching that's like, hey, do I need to go to art school? Should I maybe? 
it can help in many ways, but you don't necessarily need it. I think that, um, especially for people in the queer community, the arts are a unique way to express many things that often get bottled up inside for one reason or another, whether it be safety related, because you can't talk about things with your family unit, and uh, or you, uh, you know, there's just, just a lot you need to get out. And art's a great way to do that. I think that's a big part of why I love it, what we do here at the New Haven Pride Center, because we do uh, have a focus on queer arts and culture and uh, really treat it as a crucible for avenue, uh, you know, for people to explore who they are and how to articulate their queer reality. Uh, you know, in the case of uh, Don and myself, I think we both uh, explore our relationship to the virus through the work we create. Uh, sometimes, um, at least on my end, uh, I definitely have some collectors who, uh, especially with cu couples, I've noticed this happens, where one will really like a piece, but if it deals with one of my darker narratives, like this one behind me, for example, uh, the, their partner will be like, oh, I like that, but I can't stir that in the house. You know, <laughs> Sometimes when you work with darker subject matter or subject matter that can be perceived as dark, um, it's a tough sell. <laughs> but ultimately, I always paint for me, and I'm lucky enough to find people that connect with it. Um, you know, I work uh, entirely outside the gallery system. I am a word of mouth artist. Uh, I show very infrequently, um, but I am really just committed to honing my craft in the service of what I consider a form of active meditation. You know, I've been a Buddhist for most of my life, uh, my adult life, I should say. I was raised this weird hybrid of reformed Jewish and Catholic uh, Italian mom, so you can't really escape it one way or the other. She might have an interfaith marriage, but she definitely <laughs> had me go to church a fair amount, especially for a Jewish kid. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think for me, it's just about exploring narratives through color. Uh, I'm very process-based. Um, really, uh, the exploration uh, and interplay between layers, especially, I think there's a really beautiful way that layering and texture for me acts as a metaphor for the human experience. You know, as we age, as we go through this journey of life and get gather twists and turns, um, we build texture in ourselves and we build layers. And sometimes the layers that are more recent get gouged through and, and rupture forward. Sometimes um, there's this this idea of, of breaking with the surface, right? I, I'm very influenced um, for the fashion history, or uh, sorry, the, wow, in work brain, for the art history nerds out there, um, if you're into Cy Twombly, uh, he is a very resonant piece of my visual vocabulary. In a lot of his work, he talks about this idea of mark making and the corruption of a surface, or a surface that has, has somehow been transformed through the act of mark making. And in certain series, he would really grotesquely take this you know, to an extreme. Uh, and those pieces of his always really spoke to me, so I really have always worked to integrate that into my work as a uh, as again, a metaphor for how trauma can affect us and make us feel like our layers are ripped open and our layers are being exposed um, that maybe have been painted over uh, in one way or another. Well, and, and that, that actually is a perfect segue to my first question. Um, and I'm gonna start with you, John, even though in the exhibit we started uh, in the order of showing, we started with Jonathan's art. Um, I, I just wanna give you a moment to talk a little bit about the work you are exhibiting in this particular exhibit. Um, you know, you have, I would say, you know, kind of three very powerful, very different pieces of art. Um, and, and I just wanted to say, you know, what, what was your thinking about these pieces and, and um, how it relates to this exhibit? Well, when I applied to the open call last year, I had done these pieces the previous summer and um, I knew they would be a good fit for this month, although I didn't um, pitch them that way. I just described what they were and it naturally kind of fell into place. So I, um, I was processing a lot of loss during my time in grad school. Um, I thought I had worked through a lot of it because um, it had happened a long time ago, um, the loss of my first partner to AIDS, and then my parents passing about 12 years ago, and they died six months apart. Um, and then I began 
um, that's kind of when I began painting again from like undergrad. And then I went into commercial art. And then after my parents died, well, after Peter died, I, I stopped making my own art. And then after my parents died, I, I, I was living in DC and there were all these great galleries. And for many years I've been, I would have the thought, why aren't I making my, why am I not making my own art? It's because I was just consumed with my jobs all the time. So I moved home to be closer to my family and um, to work on my own art. Um, I also became an art teacher. And then that summer in the MFA program, um, I don't know, my, my first, I, I had saved a collage for years and I did not realize I was processing my mother when I turned into, turned it into a painting. And then I kind of did some work about my dad. And that, then that summer, I have health insurance that requires that I get my prescriptions by mail, which I sometimes hate and sometimes like, but they changed vendors that summer and the new vendor really screwed up my medications. So I had difficulty getting my HIV medication. So that was on my brain a lot. And that brought Peter back to me a lot. And so I was working on creating surfaces with texture, trying to represent spiritual energy. Um, and I also took a DIY kind of sculpture class and uh, walking around Boston, I, I, I work with found objects and I saw these two tires and I said to myself, don't, because I don't, I, I'll just have more stuff. But then a couple of days later, I had an idea and I ran back and there was one tire left. Um, so the piece denied, um, which is a set of medical bottles, uh, medicine bottles, um, it kind of shows my background in graphic design. Um, denied has the word die and end in it. So they're printed in different colors, one black, one white, and they circle a, bo a bottle of Victarvi, which was the medication I was having a hard time getting. Um, the sculpture of, I took the tire and made it into a sculpture and I called that Peter, who was my first partner. And it's, uh, to me, it represents, the circle represents the human body. And so it's, it's the body slowly dying. The tires filled with nails, which is the HIV virus. And it's, de it's not melting, it's decomposing. Um, to me. And then the plastic tapestry surface art, um, plastic painting, I call them. Um, it's called every with every fiber of your being. And that kind of it has to do with the fight fight against AIDS when you're living with AIDS and dying from AIDS, and then letting go and actually dying and the transition of the spirit to wherever it goes. So that's what the two pieces are about. You know, awesome. I, I am struck by, I, I am struck by your use of let it go, actually, specifically just now, John, because um, the pieces that I'm showing uh, for the purposes of this exhibition, uh, many of them, some of these glyph-like marks that you'll see that are common uh, in my work, uh, many times in this collection, you'll actually see fragments of the phrase, let it go. Um, the collection overall, as I said, uh, as, as I may have mentioned before, uh, is Leith, which would be the Greek river of forgetfulness. And so, um, whereas my prior collections were about processing the trauma of Sarah conversion while it was happening uh, and right after it happened. Uh, now, similar to you were saying, you know, oh, it's been so many years um, since, since this thing happened to me. Uh, and I was surprised that I, you know, I thought I had worked through it. Uh, and so part of Leith is, is this idea of when do we choose um, to drink from the river of forgetfulness, not in the, the sense of sweeping something under the rug, but of saying this, I've processed this, I've moved through this, this is no longer serving me. Um, I think 
for those of us who are HIV positive, there's this uh, dance we do with the virus in our minds. Uh, and part of that dance is, for me anyway, um, oscillating between this form of placid acceptance of, okay, this is a thing that's happened to me. There's like, nothing I can do about it. It, it, is, it is a thing. Uh, and then saying, I have moved past reaction to stigma or issues with, um, you know, um, access to medicine or things. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a form of grief. Um, you know, my mother too passed when I uh, was younger, uh, around 12 years ago, actually, uh, in 2006, uh, when I was 19. And it's very similar to grief. Uh, in the sense that you will have these strong waves of emotion. I do a lot of wave-like imagery as well. Um, the, one of the pieces uh, in the weeds uh, on view has this deep blue segment um, that's all about like if you're going to the river forgetfulness and there's this tangle of weeds and those weeds are the memories and the things that trigger you or the things that um, bring you back to that moment of sitting in the doctor's office when they look awkwardly at a, um, you know, uh, clipboard and look at you and say, I, I, I'm sorry to tell you this, but so on and so on, and that deafening ellipsis um, that follows. And I think um, most, or at least a lot of the art from fellow positive artists uh, that I've come across, what, what I often see as a common denominator is this search for a constellation of meaning. Um, within those different triggers, within those different moments um, that always come back to that moment in some way, shape, or form of that loss, of that death, of that death of the person that you were before when you weren't HIV positive. Um, and it's almost like a pearl, right? There's a, there's a grain of sand, and around that, I think a lot of positive artists build their visual vocabulary and language if so they are doing work that is, you know, focused on that element of their experience. And so I think it's very similar to bereavement. And it's, it's uncanny to me that the similarities in what John was just saying and a lot of what has gone into my own, um, you know, journey of developing my visual language around these things. John, how does this exhibit, uh, or Jonathan rather, how does this exhibit um reflect back on your previous works around HIV, like in the Gold series, for example, which um, again, for our viewers who didn't watch, we exhibited a selection from the Gold series a number of years ago. And we have uh, one piece on semi-permanent installation here at the center. Um, you know, I, I think of those works as being, you know, they ha all have that kind of unifying feel, which I feel like this new collection similarly has a very unified feel um, For sure. But how do you, how do the two, because I think the, of the gold series is a very like in your face, you know, here are images of HIV and yeah, they're all different and they're definitely all but, more raw. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. definitely more, more blunt, more direct. I think for the gold series, I was really trying to create a, 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 a sense of textured chiaroscuro where you'd have this, um, you know, very deeply painted, textured, rigid surface that has all this different mark making, and then a solitary gold figure that's this smooth piece of gold. Or you would see the gold glinting, glinting through layers of paint and peeking through. And so um, the gold series was really the, and my, I guess I'll call it the flagship piece um, from the gold series is, is called Diagnosis. And that's a six by eight foot canvas. Um, that you can absolutely come and make an appointment to check out here at my studio um, in Bridgeport. If you would like to see um, Diagnosis, it is for sale. Uh, six by eight foot is actually my preferred and favorite size to work. I do enjoy working large. Um, and everything came from that. I think I was really trying to go on this sort of mimetic journey with the Gold Series, where it was a very literal like, okay, we started at Diagnosis. That was the painting I had the idea for first, but actually executed something like 15 pain paintings in or so. Um, but I knew I wanted to have that impactful piece that said, like, this is the moment. Like, this was that moment where, you know, the, the cookie crumbled, uh, or at least that's how it felt at the time, um, you know, and, and really translating that to the viewer. Because I felt that part of my job as an artist is to engender these conversations that for many are either difficult, awkward, um, or tense. Uh, you know, as I shared it when I last spoke about the Gold Series at the Center, 
um, you know, I had pieces that dealt with mother to child transmission of HIV, HIV for the incarcerated, um, which Patrick actually, I'll share for the viewers, but there was a, a gentleman who came to the center and I wasn't there one day and all of a sudden I get this text from Patrick and he's like, oh my God, we had the most beautiful moment with this guy who went up to the painting of the incarcerated, uh, per, per, the, the incarcer HIV in, in, in lockup and he was just transfixed by it and said like, oh my God, I, I get it. Because he, he had been in lockup and he had seen what HIV behind bars is, looks like, entails. And it was one of the most, I, I was like sitting in my office, like crying, just like, oh my God. Ah, ah. And that was the point of the exhibition. That was the point of the 50 pieces was, you know, in doing a collection of that volume, um, part of it was, I was almost trying like a Hydra to, to come up with, I was deter determined to, to define what some way for someone, even just for one piece of the 50 to connect to this idea of transformation through diagnosis and to and start that um, that conversation or that um, dialogue within the viewer. Um, and so ironically enough, maybe like the receptor cells on the virus itself, I was <laughs> trying to, to, to go there with the gold series. Whereas with our um, Leith, this new, um, new collection, uh, as my collectors have said, so for the, you know, it's much lighter because for me, I was trying to showcase that transition, right? From, I'll call it the hot period, where it's like right after diagnosis and the, and the first wave of processing. And this collection is more like the third wave of processing that came after the second wave that was much more quiet. I didn't really have anything to do with my painting process and was more uh, my spiritual practice, meditation, um, and things like this. Uh, and writing, I'm also a writer, um, shocking, uh, considering I publish kids' books. But, uh, you know, I, I think for this collection, for Leith, it, it was about, you know, one was focused on the darkness. Now this is focused on the light of release, of that moment of exhalation, of those times where you step into your power and say, yeah, this thing happened to me, this exists, this is a part of me, but it's no longer being explored from a place of, I have been forever changed by this, it is, now being explored through the lens of I am stepping into my power about this and now owning it as part of my narrative without it owning me back, um, without the rawness that you see in the gold series. And I think that comes through in a lot of the muted tones. Um, I also, you know, you'll mm. see in Stolen Moments, which is the really bright piece uh, that is for some uncharacteristically bright for my work. Uh, and what really strikes me about that piece and why I bring it up is because even though we've moved, you know, thematically from the darker to the lighter, if you look on that canvas, there's actually a bunch of black silk thread that's kind of in this like congealed ball that's on the side of this really bright piece, not quite on the edge, but really near to it, because you still have those moments, those tangled moments of even within the brightness of stepping through the power of saying this is no longer defining me. It's that moment where someone is seraphobic and terrible on a dating app. It's that moment where you, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, I know I spoke to Patrick about the fact that I was like, oh my God, you know, my medication is in back order. I have no idea how I'm going to get it. I have like no clue what's going on. My doctor's worried. I'm worried. What the hell is happening? Um, and it's that, that, that chronic moment where is the rug going to be pulled? For one, for one reason or, or another. Um, and I think, you know, it's important that people understand as, as a positive um, artist, when you look at the work of someone who is HIV positive, take an extra minute to really explore your facility for metaphor. Look for the mm -hmm. metaphors in, in what we do because we are most often, and, and this is especially true for, I think, abstractionists like myself, um, we are always trying to send a few messages at once. I guess you could call us semiotically economical. You know, we like to pack a lot in a little. And uh, for me, I again, I think similar to John, I, I do that through texture. I do that through manipulation of process and or surface and uh, try to, I guess, provide a topography for my reality that people can look at and, and 
visually touch. I wouldn't necessarily recommend touching it. Uh, <laughs> but well, and it's yeah, interesting you say, right. yeah, and when it's interesting you say about like the the idea of that, oh, it's uncharacteristically light for you or 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 bright. Um, you know, I it's it's fascinating to me that. 90% of the works in this exhibit, which ironically are in the exact same color palette somehow, totally planned that, did not plan that. Um, <laughs> the accidental curator. The accidental, curator. accidental curatorial success. Um, but the way in which these works work together in their lightness, but still having that very strong message, and then sometimes a very strong message that isn't light. Um, you know, I think of, for example, the piece behind you, John, um, you know, it's, it's empowering, it's beautiful, it's stunning, but it's also dark. There's, there's components of it that have that, that um, sadness or darkness to it. And so, I mean, John, you're actually sitting in the room right now. And so you're among all of these works. You know, do you see that correlation between kind of what Jonathan's talking about, how his work came together and, and how some of your pieces that were really created out of uh, real stress and real like emotional deep places? Oh, that's hard for me to answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan said uh, he he referred he used the term process art, and I think of um, like my artistic practice as a uh, process art because <laughs> to me that. The term process art is is art which shows how it was made, um, and that was not necessarily my intention. My when I'm making art, um, I change my mind a lot, and new and or, or other ideas come up, like you know, think like thoughts I thought I had put to rest. I I realize I'm working on in my art or. Um, I just, I just see something and it takes a different turn. So, um, the emotion in these pieces is, is, is there because they're very personal. Um, and they're about extremely emotional moments. Um, uh, that I experienced like denied is like comes from claim denied insurance company denied my claim. I'm like, you know, I have insurance. You just are not running it right. And it was like really frustrating. Um, not as emotionally traumatic as, um, death, you know, death of loved ones. Um, but that's, those are these three pieces. That's not my entire, my entire artistic practice is not about loss. Otherwise I would be terribly depressed all the time. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, I make really colorful paintings too. And um, I'm working on, um, I guess I do go for the, uh, I don't know. I guess I do go for the emotional sometimes. I'm working on a piece called um, a COVID clock, which is a a clock with um, like vials, blood vials turning around it. Um, mm. And then I'm working on this strange kind of hanging sculpture made out of rubber tires pieces like that I find on the highway. Um, like truck tires that blew up. So they come from an explosion. So they have like this huge bang to them. So it's going to be, I think, a strong piece. Um, hmm. And yeah, I don't know. I just, you know, people ask me where, where I get my ideas. Like one, one friend of mine and she's like, you know, are you influenced by certain people or do people look at your work and then, name artists and i said yeah I, I i just think of stuff and then people look at my work and bring up all the references and i'm not as art historical as some um practicing artists are i 
I like to see what's going on and I like to look at contemporary and modern art, but I have to be really careful because I can be easily influenced, mm. you know, steal like an artist and I try to be as authentic as possible. Well, and I would say that, um, you know, all three of your pieces, you know, I could see correlation to other artists, perhaps with Denied, um, but I feel like all of your pieces feel very authentic and feel like they come from a very emotionally raw, uh, authentic place. So, um, and I mean, I think of like uh, the larger, your larger installation, which by the way, you are officially the largest piece of art we have had at the center. Um, coming for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think <laughs> of that piece and kind of the emotional reaction that um, our director of case management, who's also an artist, uh, had when he saw it, he saw the image of it because um, I had shared it with the staff and he he just kind of stared at it for about 10 minutes and was like clearly processing what his feelings were. And then once he saw the whole piece, because that was obviously a, a crop, um, you know, he started, he, you know, I mean, you heard him on the phone. He, he kind of almost didn't say anything during the tour because he was kind of processing how he was feeling. Um, and I, I think that can only happen when it's coming from an authentic place personally. Um, so no, so no, so no, I, I see you as, as, you know, they always say that, you know, it's art because someone said so, well, I'm saying it's art, you know, um, so I'm <laughs> saying it's authentic. Um, but, but yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think with, uh, also with the topics that you're, you're exploring, uh, you know, I, for example, with the tire piece, which as I said on the, uh, virtual tour is, is probably one of my favorite pieces, um, from any exhibit that we've ever had. And the reason why I, when I saw your word, I was like, oh, we got to exhibit this. Um, but that piece, it, you know, d having not lost a loved one to HIV, I, I'm very fortunate I'm not lost. Um, I have many friends who are positive, but I haven't lost someone, uh, but I immediately feel it. Um, and once we were talking through the various components, like the nails, I, I you know, you feel it in a very heavy way. Um, so thank you. I don't know where I was going with that. I just felt like I needed to say mm, that, fine. I guess. <laughs> There's a lot um, of work, work with nails. Um, yeah, and so I, uh, that just came together and um, it's probably been done. Um, I, like I was trying, I was trying to visualize in my art, spiritual energy. And that's how I got into texture and working with texture. Um, and um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, the tire piece came out of that because I was thinking about spirit. Hmm. Well, and I think I feel the texture in both your pieces. And I, I know from Jonathan that a lot of the texture in your pieces come from a similar place. Oh, yeah, 500% um, that. I, uh, you know, for the longest time until this collection leaf, I didn't even really work on paper because I felt like I couldn't build up the textures that I was seeing in my head uh, appropriately. Um, but I have now, I guess, stepped outside of that box and um, it's actually been really fun. Um, I've been really enjoying it, I think. What I like about juxtaposing John's work and mine in the space right now uh, with this exhibit in general, again, accidental curatorial fabulousness, um, is the idea that we represent two different, not quite full generations of the experience of HIV, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I think it's really important, you know, we talk in the queer community a lot about bridging generational divides in productive ways to make sure that queer heritage culture and um, just oral tradition to call it, you know, to call it what it is, um, is sometimes lost um, to the cult of youth, to um, just the nature of how, uh, you know, arguably sexualized queer culture can be sometimes. Um, and I think that these pieces sharing the space right now provide a really unique dialogue um, between two very different experiences of what HIV and AIDS mean um, and how they were differently contextualized for us by sheer virtue of the fact that, um, you know, I think we, you know, no matter 
because of how new HIV is as a virus in the global sense, even just 5, 10, 15 years difference um, means that you were given a different landscape into which HIV uh, and AIDS play, you know, played a part. And so I think it's an interesting uh, accidental common denominator, um, this shared textuality, this shared, uh, accidentally shared color palette. There's something there um, that I think bears consideration for anyone interested in, in, in viewing um, both John's and, John and my pieces, um, you know, in remembrance of World AIDS Day, um, which I would like to remind our viewers is tomorrow and is Giving Tuesday. It is. <laughs> well, and, and you know, it's interesting you say that, John, because I hadn't really thought about it in that context of the pieces being kind of different perspectives from different generations, but also having that kind of contextual combination. And that's really interesting because that's kind of uh, similarly reflected in uh, the work that we're um, doing tomorrow uh, with uh, Noah and Arian and, um, and Alex, you know, these artists um, all are coming from different perspective in the way I described, because I was trying to find a way to elevate our sentence, describe it to someone today. And, you know, the, the kind of haphazard way I said it was the, the, the piece Night Sweats is about the 1990s and the experience of HIV and that resurgence, that, that change. But it's through this lens of the new generation in Noah and Arian. And it's, it, it creates this very fascinating textualization. And I think the same thing is happening kind of, again, accidentally in this exhibit um, with the, the, the way the works are interacting with each other. Um, I do have a uh, question from the audience from actually from Noah, our composer for Night Sweats. Um, and it's, can I ask a question? How does art influence change in the way society is practiced? Um, and, and also shout out from Alex Garbera who said, good question. Um, so I'm gonna pose that question to the two of you and I'm gonna start with Jonathan, you go first. So how does art influence change in the way society is practiced? I think that, well, I think that's a very dense question. I think it's a great question. <laughs> I think for one thing, the feedback loops between art and society are as varied as intersectional realities. I think that the way art influences society, um, you know, is complex because of things like class and economics. For example, um, you know, the art world is notoriously exclusionary for many different uh, people, queer uh, folks, but uh, black, brown, disabled folks. Um, you know, I think that however, is a challenge because artists need patrons to survive and create more work and pay for spaces like this and uh, get it out there, but it's inherently tied to some form of class consciousness because we're typically selling uh, to people that have the disposable income to acquire. Um, you know, and at a certain price point, you are moving work to people that can just drop $8,500 on a, on, a, on a rectangle for, the, for their wall. Uh, you know, or if it's large scale work, like my six by eights or John's work behind him right now, you know, um, who has the, who has the flat wall empty real estate to cover in a piece like that in their own home, if not a large home, which is ostensibly expensive. Um, so I think art can serve us in many ways. I think it serves negatively in that sense that it becomes a class thing, but I think art more widely, not necessarily fine art or gallery art, um, is omnipresent and everywhere. I think that's why representation matters. You know, in my work at Little Red Fashion, just step outside, you know, that, that's still art to me. I do the art direction for what we do there as well, uh, as well as writer books. And um, that is why we need to use art to showcase what's more important. You know, I think, especially for people with HIV and AIDS, um, it's important for us as a minority within a minority to use art to empower those of us who are also positive to say hey you know there are ways that you can find to express what you're feeling about your relationship to the virus i think for those who are negative it can recontextualize what hiv means other than just like someone's status you know that you're checking in on because you want to have intercourse with them uh, i think uh, there are many realities that people who have hiv face that people who are negative just don't think about and don't realize and don't um wouldn't otherwise if not for the arts uh, produced by people with HIV and AIDS and, and also the queer uh, community in general, queer art 
And artists uh, are the standard bearers in many ways. And this extends not just to painting and sculpture and traditional fine arts, but the art of drag. Uh, you know, I think that art can influence our culture in as many ways as we can put it out there. I think that's why uh, places like the Pride Center and arts institutions are so vital because without spaces to create a curatorial effect, how are you going to get people to interact with it except for those people who can necessarily afford it? The only way to make art accessible writ large is through more things like this, is through more organizations like Pride Center uh, centering um, marginalized voices. Uh, I think that that's the best way for art to influence the way society operates is, is by exposure and dialogue. Um, and, you know, that engenders access. Um, whether or not someone can procure a piece is one thing, but people can look at it and interact with it and walk by it. You know, one of the biggest things I miss because of COVID is being able to go to the museum. No, I can absolutely not afford an original Joseph Albers or a Jasper Johns, but I can absolutely go sit there and appreciate it and interact with it and have um, a moving experience with it. Do I have the space to rebuild the Rothko Chapel from the Minot Collection? No, I don't, but I can go there. I've gone there and stood there and silently cried for like 45 minutes um, <laughs> and had a moving art experience. And I think um, art is at its best when it in creates those moments for as many people as possible for as many diverse narratives as possible, which is why, uh, you know, I think our art institutions, thing, you know, like MoCA, LACMA, The Met, all that, they have a lot of work to do from the top down in centering more diverse voices from people who don't necessarily have access, from people who have historically been known as outsider artists, um, because those narratives otherwise won't get told to as many people and can impact society less because of less exposure. Uh, you know, it's like that Oregon Trail meme, like you, artist has died from exposure. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, know, um, you know, getting art out there is important and making sure artists can continue to create art by supporting them is equally as important. So I think society uh, can be influenced in that way. Yeah, by, you know, uh, showcasing narratives is the first step to building bridges of understanding and that's what art does. John, what are your, what are your thoughts about how art can influence change in society and, and one of the, the specific parts of this question from Noah is kind of how it how art about HIV or by HIV positive individuals could potentially um, influence activism and, and change for people living with HIV. Well, I think my understanding of avant-garde art is art that want to affect social change and it's very debatable as to if that is possible um or how um effective it can be um there's there are many societies there are many cultures so um i think you have to really know who you're trying to reach um and you have to come up with a really iconic image hmm. i'm thinking in terms of social marketing back in the day like the the aids the aids equals death poster to me is is an icon now. It's it's like it's like the Mona Lisa to me. It's it's just so pure and memorable, um, and deeply, deeply um, haunting and meaningful. And I think that poster had a huge effect in encouraging activism and the activism of ACT UP. Um, that art, that activism, was art in itself took the form of performance art um, in, in their protests, in their, I'd say, street installations. Um, the red tape one still, to mm. me, is amazing. Um, so I think it's possible. It's, it's just you, you have to be very daring and have bold ideas. And you really have to, you know, they were trying to get attention 
because people weren't paying attention. So it's a, it's a time when attention seeking is a good thing, um, not an egoic thing. And if you can make that shift, then I think, you know, art can have an impact on social change. So we're, we're in our, our final stretch here. So I'm gonna ask uh, my last question. Uh, I'm gonna start with you, John. Um, and, and my question is, if you, if, if our viewers of, of the tour or, or those who are able to come by and actually see the exhibit in person, which by the way, you will be able to make appointments to come see this exhibit in person um, uh, starting on Thursday. Um, but if you'd like to, if someone is to, to stand in front of your art and take a look at it, what's the one thing that you want them to walk away from in the context of this exhibit? I want, I want it to make them think. I don't necessarily want them to get it. Um, I don't want them to necessarily um, have it mean what it means to me. Um, I want it to be as open as possible and I, I, I hope they can find themselves in it. Jonathan, what about you? Um, I would like them to look at these pieces through the lens of thinking about the heavy things that they themselves carry that maybe they sometimes think they're over or they've accepted and those moments of when they pop up by surprise when you're not expecting it when you're on the line at starbucks and someone rebuffs you on grinder because you have hiv and says something nasty Th think of think of what you have in common not in the exact experience of someone who has hiv but especially if you're negative, think of what would it be like for me to have to unburden, to drink from this river of forgetfulness? Where are the things in my life that have shaped me in through how traumatic they were? And what has that experience of moving through that been like for me? And where can I find a common denominator through what I'm looking at um, with someone else whose experience is, is different and who is um, coming at it through a lens of HIV? I think that's what my work is usually trying to, at least in this collection, um, ask the, the viewer to do. Ask them to sip of that river of forgetfulness for themselves and find the common threads that tie what they would choose with what I have chosen as the subject matter for this collection, which is, again, my second wave of acceptance of my status and moving through it from now the perspective of, you know, uh, I guess you could say the an elder statesman, an old hat, been around the block for a minute. Uh, <laughs> 10 awesome. years in. So that's what I hope. Well, thank you both for sharing pieces of yourselves, um, your art, obviously, um, and for being a part of, uh, you know, the center's World, World AIDS Day observation. Um, you know, I, I really feel like this exhibit is a, a major, major component of the power that the next few days are going to have. Um, I think, you know, I, I hope those of you who are watching will consider coming to see the exhibit in person uh, by making a reservation or, or going on the center's YouTube to watch the uh, virtual tour that we took. Um, both the virtual tour and reservations will be up on the center's website tomorrow. Um, and uh, are currently, you can actually see the virtual tour on the Facebook right now, uh, and it will be up on, it's, it's currently uploading to YouTube as we speak. Um, and so it should be available later today or tomorrow. But I, I just wanna thank all of you again for, for being a part of this. Um, and I, I wanna give one final shout out to uh, tomorrow's performance of Night Sweats. Uh, I hope all of you will join us. It's you know a world premiere uh, of the highest caliber that you would potentially see in some of the most impressive uh, performance venues in this country. And you get to see it for free virtually from your living room tomorrow. So I hope you'll join us for the world premiere of Night Sweats. It begins at 7.30. Um, similar to wh where we are here today, you're gonna feel and see and experience a lot of what that is. Um, and oh, thank you, Dolores. Dolores, who also a member of the board, who's been following along everything today. Um, Hi, Dolores. Thank, thank you both for, for being a part of um, the now kind of uh, history of the center's uh, art exhibit series uh, and a part of, part of World AIDS Day Observation. Thank you for having me, Patrick, and those of you who are watching. 
Um, and it's my honor. Well, yep. thank you, everyone. Thank you.